All right, welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of Splunk's.com 2021 virtual. We are here live in the Splunk studios uh, here in Silicon Valley. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. Spiros Xanthos, VP of Product Management for Observability with Splunk is here inside theCUBE. Spiros, thanks for coming on. Great to see you. John, thanks a lot for having me. Glad to be here. We love observability. Of course, we love Kubernetes, but that was before observability became popular. We've been covering KubeCon since it was invented, even before during the OpenStack days. Uh, a lot of open source uh, momentum with you guys, with observability and also in the customer base. So I want to thank you for coming on. Give us the update. What is uh, the observability story? It's clearly in the headlines of all the stories. Silicon Angle's headline is multi-cloud observability security, Splunk doubling down on all three. Correct. Big part of the story is observability. Correct. And you mentioned uh, KubeCon. I was there last week as well. Uh, it seems that observability and security are the two most common buzzwords you hear these days, different from how it was when we started. <laughs> but uh, yes, Splunk actually has made a huge investment in observability, uh, starting with the acquisition of VictorOps three years ago, and then with Omniscient and SignalFX, and last year with uh, uh, Plumber, um, a synthetics company we acquired called Rigor, and uh, uh, Flowmill, a uh, network monitoring company. And plus a lot of in organic investment we made over the last two years, to essentially build an end-to-end -end observability platform that brings together metrics, traces, and logs, or otherwise infrastructure monitoring, log analytics, application monitoring, digital experience monitoring, all in one platform to manage, let's say, traditional legacy and modern cloud native apps. For the folks that know SiliconANGLE and the Cube know we've been really following the, this, this from the beginning for Signal FX, remember when they started. Um, they never changed their course. They've always, they, had the right, they had the right history, and it was bought by Splunk. You guys, same way. Open source and cloud was poo-pooed upon. People were like, oh, it's not secure, it's not, it never worked. Now it's the center of all the action. Yes. And so that's really cool and thanks for doing that. The other thing I want to get your point on is, what does an end-to-end -end observability mean? Because there's a lot of observability companies out there right now saying, Correct. hey, we're the solution, we're the utility, we're the tool, but I haven't seen a platform. So what's your uh, answer to that? Yes, so observability, in, in my opinion, in the context of what you're describing, means two things. One is that uh, when, I, when we say end-to-end -end observability, it means that instead of having, let's say, multiple monitoring tools that are siloed, so let's say one for monitoring network, one for monitoring infrastructure, a separate one for monitoring APM that do not work with each other, we bring all of these telemetry in one place, we connect it, and exactly because actually applications and infrastructure themselves are becoming one, you have a way to monitor all of it from one place. So that's observability. But the other thing that observability also is, because these environments tend to be a lot more complex, it's not just about connecting them, right? It's also about having enough data and enough analytics to be able to make sense out of those environments and solve problems faster than you could do in the past with traditional monitoring. That's a great definition. I gotta then ask you, one of the things that's coming up that came out of KubeCon was clear, is that the personnel to hire to run this stuff, it's not everyone can get the skills gap problem. At the same time, automation is at an all-time high. People are automating and doing AI ops, Git ops, what do you want to call it? There's a buzzword for that. Basically automating the data observability into the CI CD pipelining. Huge trend right now. And the speed of developers is fast now. They're coding fast. They don't want to wait. I agree. So and that's exactly what's happening, right? We went essentially from traditional IT where developers would develop something that would be deployed months later by some IT professional to of course all of this coming together, but we're not stopping there as you say, right? That is shifting left, it's going earlier into the pipeline. Uh, everyone expects essentially, let's say monitoring to happen at the speed of deployment. And uh, I guess observability again is this, uh, not, not the, or as a requirement of observability is this idea, let's say, that I should be able to monitor my applications in real time and you know, get information as soon as something happens. What's the evolution of the shift left trend? Obviously, for the people who don't know what shift left is, you put security at the beginning, not bolt it on at the end, and developers can do it with automation, all that good stuff that they have. But how, how real is that right now in terms of it's happening? Can you, can you share some um, uh, vision and ideas and anecdotal data on how, how fast shift left is, or, or is there still bottlenecks in security groups and IT groups? So there are bottlenecks for sure. In my opinion, we are where with, uh, let's say, the shift left or the DevSecOps uh, trend, where we were between IT and devs maybe a few years ago. And it's both a cultural evolution that has to happen. So security teams and developers have to come closer together, understand, like say, the consensus or the requirements of each other so they can work better together, the way it happened with DevOps. And also it's a tooling problem, right? Like still observability or monitoring solutions are not working very well with security yet. We at Splunk, of course, make this a priority and we have the platform to integrate all the data in one place. But I don't think it's generally something that we have achieved as well as an industry yet. 
and including the cultural aspects of it. Is that why you think end-to-end -end is important to hit that piece there so that people feel like it's all working together? I think end-to-end -end is important for two reasons, actually. One is that, essentially, you ha as you say, you hit all the pieces from the point of deployment, let's say, all the way to production. But it's also because, I think, applications and infrastructure, ephemeral infrastructure with Kubernetes, uh, microservices, are introducing so much more complexity that you need a step function improvement in the tooling as well, right? So that you can keep up with the complexity. Yeah. So bringing everything together and applying analytics on top is the way, essentially, to have this step function improvement in how your monitoring solution works uh, so that it can keep up with the complexity of the underlying yeah, infrastructure application. That is a application. huge, huge point, Spiros. I got to double down on that with you and say, uh, let's expand that because that's the number one problem. Taming the complexity yes. without slowing down, right? So what is the best practice for that? What do people do? Because, I mean, I know it's evolving, it's going faster, but it's still getting better, but not always there. But what can people do to go faster? So, and I will add that it's even more complex than just what the cloud, let's say, native applications introduce, because especially large enterprises have to maintain their, their footprint, their on-prem footprint, legacy applications that are still in production, and then still expand. So it's additive to the, what they have today, right? If somebody was to start from a clean slate, let's say, start with Kubernetes today, maybe yes, we have the cloud native tooling to monitor that, but that's not the reality of most, most yeah. enterprises out there, right? So I think our goal at Splunk, at least, is to be able to essentially work with our customers through their digital, digital transformation and cloud journey, so to be able to support all their existing applications, but also help them bring those to the cloud and develop new applications uh, in a cloud native fashion, let's say, and we have the tooling, I think, to support all of that, right? Between, let's say, our uh, yeah. original data platform and our metrics and traces platform that we developed further. That's awesome. And one quick question on the customer side. If I'm a customer, uh, I want observability, I want this, I want everything you just said. How do I tell the difference between a pretender and a player? A good solution and a bad solution. What, what are the signals that this is the real deal, that's a fake product? Agree, so, um, I mean, everyone obviously believes they're original, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not sure if I, I will. But you know the name names. Here's, here's my, my, my perspective on what uh, truly is a requirement for observability, right? First of all, I think we have moved past the time where, let's say, proprietary instrumentation and data collection was a differentiator. In fact, it actually, uh, is a problem today if you are deploying that because it creates silos, right? If I have a proprietary instrumentation approach for my application, that data cannot be connected to my infrastructure or my logs, let's say, right? So that's why we believe OpenTelemetry is the future and we start there in terms of data collection. Once we standardize, let's say, data collection, then the problem moves to analytics. And that's, I think, where the future is, right? So observability is not just about collecting a bunch of data and dumping it back to the user, it's about making sense out of this data, right? So the name of the game is analytics and machine learning on top of the data. And of course, the more data you can collect, the better it is from that perspective. And of course then, when we're talking about enterprises, mm -hmm. scale, controls, uh, compliance, all of these matter. And I think real time matters a lot as well, right? Yeah. We cannot be alerting people after minutes of a problem that has happened, but within a few seconds, if, we're, if we wanted to really be proactive. I think one thing I'd like to throw out there, maybe get your reaction to is I think maybe one other thing might be enabling the customer to code on top of it. Because I think trying to own the vertical stack as well is also risky as a vendor to sell to a company. Having the ability to add programming ability on top of it. I completely agree actually. And in generally giving more control to the users and how, to, what do they do with their data, let's say, right? And even allowing them to use open source yeah. whatever it's appropriate for them, right? In combination maybe with a vendor solution when they don't want to invest themselves. Build their own apps, build yes. their own experience. That's the way the world works, that's software. Agree, and again, yeah. Splunk from the beginning was about that, right? Like we have thousands yeah. of apps built <laughs> on top of our platform. Awesome, well I want to talk about open source and the work you're doing with open telemetry. I think that's super important. Again, go back even five, 10 years ago. Oh my God, the cloud's not secure. Oh my God, open source has got security holes. Turns out it's actually the opposite now. The opposite. So, you know, <laughs> finally the people woke up. No, but it's gotten better. You know? yes, yes. So take us through the open telemetry and what you guys are doing with that. Yes, so first of all, um, my belief, my personal belief is that in the, there's no future where in infrastructure is anything but open source, right? Because people do not trust actually closed source solutions in terms of security. They prefer open source at this point. So I think that's the future. And in that sense, uh, a few years ago, I guess, our belief was that all data collection and instrumentation should be standards based first of all, so that the users have control and second should be open source. That's why we, at Omnition, my co the company I co-founded that was acquired by Splunk, we uh, were one of the maintainers of open census, and then we brought together open census and open tracing in creating open telemetry. And now, open telemetry is pretty much a de facto, every vendor supports it, it's the second most active project in CNCF, and I think it's the future, right? 
both because it frees up the data and breaks up the silos, but also because it has support from all the vendors. It's in impossible for any single vendor to keep up with all this complexity and compete with the entire industry when we all come together. So I think it's a great success. It, I guess kudos to everybody, kudos to yeah. CNCF as well, that yeah. was able to actually create and some props, of these yeah, products. And CNCF's done an amazing job and been going to all those events all the years, and all the innovations have been phenomenal. I got to ask you about the silos since you brought it up multiple times, and, and again, I think this is important just to kind of put an exclamation point on. Machine learning is based upon data, okay? Yes. If you have silos, you have the ri high risk of having bad machine learning. Yes. Okay, so that's, you agree with that? Completely. So customers, now you got to understand this. <laughs> <laughs> if you have silos, that equals bad future. Correct. Because machine learning is baked into everything now. And I will add to that. So silos is the one problem, and then not being able to have all the data is another problem, right? When it comes to being able to make sense out of it. So we're big believers in what we call full fidelity. So being able to connect every byte of data and do it in a way that makes sense, obviously, economically for the customer, but also have, let's say, high signal to noise ratio, right? By structuring the data at the source, OpenTelemetry is another contributor to that, and by collecting all the data, and by having an ability, let's say, to connect the data together, metrics, traces, logs, events, incidents, then we can actually build a lot more effective tooling on top to provide answers back to the user with high confidence, so then users can start trusting the answers as opposed to they themselves always having to figure out where the problem is. And I think that's the future, and we're just starting. Spears, I want to ask you now, my final question is about culture. Uh, and, um, you know, when you have scale with the cloud and data goodness where you have people actually know the value of data and they incorporate it into their application, you have advantages, you have competitive advantages in some cases, but developers who are just coding love DevOps because it's infrastructure as code. They don't have to get in the weeds and do the under the hood. Data is kind of that same phenomenon right now where people want access to data, but there's certain departments like security departments and IT groups holding back and slowing down the developers who are waiting days and weeks when they want it in minutes and seconds for have these kind of things. So the trend is, well, there's first of all this, there's the cultural of, the people aren't getting along and they're hating each other or they're not liking yes. each other. There's a little conflict. Always kind of been there, but now more than ever, because why wait? I agree. How can companies shorten that cycle, make it more cohesive, still decouple the groups because you got for you got compliance. How do you maximize the best of a good security group, a good IT group, and enable as fast as possible developers? I, I agree with you, by the way, this is primarily cultural. And then of course there is a tooling gap as well, right? But I think we have to understand let's say, as a security group and as a set of developers, <laughs> what are the needs of each other, right? Why we're doing the things we're doing? Because everybody has the right intentions to some extent, right? But the truth is, there is pain. We are, me, I mean myself, like as we develop our own solutions in a cloud native fashion, we see that, right? We want to move as fast as possible, but at the same time, we want to be compliant and secure, right? And we cannot compromise, actually, on security or compliance. I mean, that's really the wrong solution here. So I think we need to come together understand what each other is trying to do and provide. And actually we need to build better tooling that doesn't get into the way. Today, oftentimes it's painful to have, let's say a compliant solution or a secure solution because it slows down development. I think we need to actually, again, maybe a step function improvement in the type of tooling we have in this space so it doesn't get into the way, right? It does the work, it provides, let's say the uh, security, the security team requires, <laughs> yeah. provides the guarantees yeah. there, but doesn't get in the way of developers. And today, it doesn't happen like this most of the time. So yeah. we'll have some ways to go. And Garth is mentioning how you guys got some machine learning around, around different products. And is one policy kind of give some, you know, open you know, guardrails for the developers to bounce around and do things until, if it, they, <laughs> until they have to put a new policy in place? Is that an answer automa with automation? I, I, big time, automation is a big part of the answer, right? I think we need to have tooling that first of all works quickly and provides the answers we need. And we have to have a way to verify that the answers are in place without slowing down developers. Splunk is, I mean, our view, let's say, of DevSecOps in particular is around that, right? Yeah. That we need to do it in a way that doesn't get in the way of, the, of, let's say, the developer and the velocity at which they're trying to, to move, but also at the same time, collect all the data and yeah. make sure, you know, we know what's going on in the environment. Is AI ops and DevSecOps and GitOps all the same thing in your mind, or is it all just I, I mean, labels? I mean, it's not necessarily the same thing, because I think AI ops, in my opinion, applies, let's say, to even more traditional environments, where you're going to automate, let's say, IT workflows, in like legacy applications and infrastructure. GitOps in my mind is maybe the equivalent when you're talking about like cloud native solutions, but as a concept potentially, is they are yeah. very close, I guess. Well, great stuff, great insight. Thanks for coming on theCUBE. Final point is what's your take this year of the, the live, we're in person, but it's virtual, we're streaming out. It's kind of a hybrid media environment. Splunk's now in the media business with the studios and everything. Yes. Uh, great announcements. What's your takeaway from the keynote this week? What's your, if you had to share to the audience, uh, 
this week's so, summary? First of all, uh, I'm, I'm, I really hope next year we're all going to be in person <laughs> yeah, in one place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, still, given the limitations we had, I think it was a great production, and thanks to everybody who was involved. So uh, my t key takeaway is that we truly actually have moved to the data age, and data is at the heart of everything we do, right? And I think Splunk has always been there as a company, but I think we ourselves really embrace that and everything we do is everything, most of the problems we solve are data problems, whether it's security, yeah. observability, DevSecOps, et cetera. So. Yeah, and I would say, I would add to that by saying that my observation is during the pandemic, now we're coming hopefully to the end of it, you guys have been continuing to ship code. Yes. And with real, not vaporware, real product, the yes. demos were real, and then the success on the open source, congratulations. Thank you. All right, thanks for coming on theCUBE, appreciate Thank it. Thank you, thanks a lot. Okay, CUBE coverage here at .com, Splunk's annual conference virtual. This is theCUBE, we're here live at the studios here at Splunk Studios for their event. I'm John Furrier with theCUBE, thanks for watching.